Hey, tonight on Ham Nation, we are remembering the first ham radio operator in space, Owen Garriott, W5LFL, just became a silent key. And uh, we wish his family all the best and send our love and our condolences out to him and to everybody who's been involved with ham radio in space over the years. We've got the solar update from Dr. T. We've got Valerie back with us tonight via Memorex. She's not live, but uh, that's the best we could do for you. George has smoke and solder. Of course, Amanda's here. And it's going to be a good show. So uh, join us, won't you? That's coming up next on Ham Nation. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by LDG Electronics. LDG Electronics provides state-of-the-art automatic antenna tuners and related products for every amateur need. Visit LDG Electronics to learn more. By ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by Peak PTT, the leading provider of push-to-talk systems for business communications. For instant, always-on nationwide communications, visit peakptt.com and use promo code TWIT for 15% off. This is Ham Nation, episode number 398 for April 17th, 2019. Remembering Owen Garriott, W5 LFL. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday night, and that means it's Ham Nation night. Now, Bob Heil is out, but that's okay because the uh, the inmates are running the asylum, and we have the usual cast of co-conspirators with us tonight. We've got Gordon West on the West Coast. Hello, Gordon. How are you tonight? I am fine, and we hope everybody has a great Easter weekend uh, coming up. Uh, this um, uh, day tomorrow, make that tomorrow, is uh, World Amateur Radio Day, and that is the uh, celebration of the International Amateur Radio Union, founded in uh, Paris, 1925. Also, uh, Don, this coming Saturday uh, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, at the DeVry University, uh, the Arizona Amateur Radio Club, along with the Arizona Red Cross Communications Club, is having their April Ham Fest, 7 a.m. till 11 a.m. That's in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And finally, Don, the Mahoning Valley Amateur Radio Association says, stand by. We've been around for 100 years, and we're going to have one heck of a celebration in October. So they're giving us sort of a heads up. And then my big question for the chat room and everyone else is, did you hear that DirecTV is soon to turn off standard definition, rendering our round DirecTV dish no more useful? Back to you, Don. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Every time I hear Phoenix, Arizona, I, I, I hear in my head Charlie Pride. Does anybody uh, go into right. San Antonio or, or Phoenix, Arizona, as he said it? I met Charlie Pride. He was one of the first really big stars that I met. Cool guy. Very, very nice guy. Got a hand like a bushel basket because he used to play baseball. But we digress. Let's go north to Mississippi, and north of me anyway, and uh, see what's going on with uh, George. How you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing pretty well, Don. It's good to be back this week. Uh, it's, well, we got more weather headed this way. I had the opportunity during the last storm to get out and do some transmitter site visiting, which is a thing we always look forward to during bad weather here. I've got, um, well, a little review of a book tonight. It's, I don't know if it's a review. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you looked in a call book to see what exactly was in there? Well, I don't have that. I've got a repeater book, and that's what we're going to look in tonight. Oh, cool. I love repeater guys. That's I try to buy one every year. I just I always like the repeater directories, even though I may not open the thing at all. I just I just really dig them. That's cool. Uh, we have got, uh, let's see, we've got Newsline with Dr. T tonight. She's going to be here with us via video. Also via video, we've got Valerie coming back tonight. She'd be with us live, but her internet is <laughs> So she's with us via Memorex. And, of course, Amanda in the chat room. How are you doing tonight, darling? 
I'm doing well. And you know what? That, that's so weird. I don't have any bad weather coming my way. So I'm looking forward to this weekend where it's going to be beautiful. And I just have to say as well, I'm really excited to see a video from Val. We've missed you so much, Valerie. I wish you could be here live with us. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah, we have we have missed her. We want to open uh, the show with a little bit of uh, sad news. Owen Gary at WD5 LFL, who was the first person to use amateur radio station from orbit, has passed away. And uh, something I didn't know in, in looking at that uh, that obit that's on the that's on your screen right now. He's a fellow Oklahoman. So uh, that's kind of cool. Um, if memory serves me, his son also went up uh, on uh, the, the space shuttle, or, or was it uh, the, the Soyuz? One of the two, but I think he was on the ISS, also operating ham radio from, from orbit. But Owen Garriott was the first one, and he has become a silent key. And uh, uh, let's, let's remember uh, Owen Garriott with a little bit of audio from Gordon. Gordon has an audio of Owen on the ham radio Bellic, from orbit. W5, uh, Lima, Foxtrot, Lima, in the spacecraft, Columbia, and I am now calling CQ, calling CQ for other stations, uh, calling W5, LFL, in the spacecraft, Columbia. Uh, we're approaching the California coast at this time, and I'll be tuning the band for the next 90 seconds to receive calls for W5, LFL, spacecraft, Columbia. Over. And his signal was so strong, I am lucky to be part of the first dozen ever to work him in space. But a station in Montana beat me out, Don. But at wow. least I was there for the first pass. Wow. I, when, I, when, I, when I think of this and, and Owen Garriott passing, the, the, uh, the poem High Flight always comes to mind, which, of course, ends with, for I uh, reached out my hand and touched the face of God. And uh, so Owen Garriott certainly flying high right now. So uh, our condolences to the family. We have got uh, something kind of cool tonight. Uh, we've got short shots coming up. And Gordon, we actually have a sponsor for your short shots tonight. So uh, let's go ahead and, and, and get into that if we can. Tonight's short shots is brought to you by the Gordon West Collection. Make waves at the next ham fest in your swanky new outfit from the Gordon West Collection. <laughs> You'll be the hippest cat at the field day site and imagine the attention you'll get from the YLs at the next ham club potluck dinner. The Gordon West Collection, strictly QRO, available exclusively at Mervyn's Gottschalk's Casual Corner. Today's man in select West Marine locations. Gordon, take it away. Well, you never know. You never know <laughs> what you're going to see, nor you never know what we're going to hear. Uh, after we worked uh, on about a year later, uh, we caught another lady we, in space. Uh, we have constant lighting, so the only time you really notice sunrise and sunset is if you happen to be looking out a window. In our That's um, the space station uh, giving a quick talk, so if we can go ahead and roll the short shots, let's go into space. And it's through the American Radio Relay League cooperating with AMSAT and cooperating with ARISS, Rosalie White's one STO has been instrumental in uh, keeping uh, uh, more parts coming to the International Space Station. And one of the biggest things about the ISS is the capability that that station is able to reach in to the schools. And when they do, the only time you really notice sunrise and sunset is if you happen to be looking out a window in our crew quarters. We can keep them as dark or as light as we like. So we try to have lights on during the day and turn the lights off at night so we get a sense of, uh, of a normal day. So talking to the International Space Station is a big deal, especially among kids in school. And uh, we encourage you to uh, work closely with ARISS and uh, take advantage of all they offer. And go to ARISS.org and see what we're trying to do to get more money raised for the many parts necessary for going into space uh, again with more stuff, including uh, slow scan television and improving. Approved uh, packet setup, it's going to be good. So a lot of volunteers are making the International Space Station, which uh, Owen uh, uh, with the uh, space shuttle was the real pioneer. Uh, gosh, 36 years ago, the space station is indeed on the air. <clears throat> And um, uh, this, uh, this contact right here was uh, with a pair of beams and uh, the, uh, uh, let's see, this was the space shuttle Atlanta. <laughs>
This is your instructor, Gordon West, Whiskey Bravo 6, Nancy, Ocean America. Good job. Keep up the good work. Hey, Gordon, great talking to you. I've gotten a little better at answering these follow-ups because there's sure been some big ones. So you never know uh, where you may be, and I may be contacting you, but to work the International Space Station rather than the shuttle, you do not need a huge setup like this. But what you do need is a low noise floor, whether it's on FM or if you're working the space satellites on sideband or CW. And guess what? We lately have a lot of noise centered between 140 and 165 megahertz. And you can see it on the spectrum scope. No, that's not a radio signal. That's EMI coming off of LEDs. Now, we did some testing, and the light-emitting diodes in the strips are not noisy at all. In fact, you can't even tell when you've got them uh, turned on. And that's because on a 12-volt strip that uh, wired communications uh, cells and others, um, the um, uh, voltage does not need to be uh, dropped down through a chopper circuit, rather just the little resistors that you see there. So when you see these kind of little LEDs, uh, do not worry, they're not making noise. That was confirmed by Chip Margelli, K7JA, who switched out his operating lamp from uh, an old, old um, <clears throat> light bulb to a new LED circuit uh, that basically ran on 12 volts. There was no noise on his HF operation in the cold up there. Uh, drones, uh, they are subjected to EMI as well. And uh, there was some concern that if you put the little LED strips on uh, drones, you're going to be able to lose contact with them at 2.4 gigs and so on. Nope, the little LED strips uh, are not noise generators. So when you see these LED strips at uh, the local uh, uh, county ham fest or uh, uh, ham organizations, uh, they are quiet. The ones that are not quiet sometimes can be traced to boating activities. And we don't blame the boaters, but it was the amplified television antennas about 20 years ago that gave out so much noise from their preamplifier that it killed GPS reception in Half Moon Bay and about four miles in any direction. So who says even GPS is not uh, jammable? Well, the FCC was quick to step in, and now those amplified TV over-the-air antennas are not noisy. However, the U.S. Coast Guard says we are so concerned that there's noise coming up on our marine channels, which are 10 megahertz higher than are two meters. Marine channels are at 156. Uh, the Coast Guard said we need to ensure that those that do radio inspections, which uh, there's uh, Pastor Jason, uh, W6AUX, uh, doing in inspections. Part now of the inspections is to take a small handheld and uh, hold it on the weather channel, ideally a weak weather channel, and then turn on and off LEDs that are lighting the uh, guest area and see whether or not that's creating interference. Well, we did some testing ourselves, and automatic identification system are those uh, short uh, broadcasts that come in on VHF channel 88 marine band, up around 162 uh, megahertz, just below the weather channels. <clears throat> the AIS is very important for shipboard safety because it lets you know who around you also is uh, sending their position through a transponder. And again, this all takes place at 156 megahertz, just 10 up from where we are. And with an LED circuit turned on, not the strips, but uh, dedicated light bulbs uh, running um, at 110 volts aboard some of these larger ships. Look at this. Our range to distant stations was not distant at all, 13 or 14 miles. Uh, when we went aboard another vessel and tested its uh, AIS, they were receiving 
nothing more than about two miles of range. Well, that's not good enough. Randy, K7AGE, who runs an AIS receive station at his location in Oregon, he's getting AIS hits hundreds, sometimes two and 300 miles away on marine VHF, well over the horizon. And that points out that he's got a low noise floor. So the U.S. Coast Guard is very concerned about LEDs, especially those that have a chopper circuit, which most of the 110 volt bulbs do. And that chopper circuit, as you can see, put noise pulses throughout the 156 megahertz fan. In fact, we can see that on some of their navigation equipment. Uh, you turn the lights on and uh, look at all the interference lines that are coming up there on the screen. You can look at it on a spectrum scope and wow, uh, those in that uh, one area, <clears throat> even way down on the 20 meter band, are beginning to pick up the sounds of noisy uh, LED light bulbs. And here was the problem. That's the AIS VHF receive antenna, the left-hand one, that's DC shunt fed. And those are two LED lights below the radar all is well until the LEDs come on and VHF reception on FM goes to pot. And these are the real killers, those that have all the circuit right there in the base of the LED bulb. And you know that it's you and your house if when running a, a VHF receiver, tuning into a noisy weather station, you turn off the circuit breakers and all of a sudden that distant weather station comes in loud and clear. Turn the circuit breakers back on and in about 10 seconds you begin to hear the noise bill like we see there on the left. So LEDs are emitting the noise directly from the bulb. So all of your efforts to put in some kind of uh, traps or chokes that we see here, uh, these uh, EMI uh, devices uh, going over coax, going over wires, they are not going to help because the noise is coming directly from the bulb base itself through the air and to your receive antenna, not to your equipment down below, but to the antenna nearby. So all of these uh, power line filters and the clamp on chokes, they're not going to help the LED problem until we get cleaner LED light bulbs. So the big deal is You've got to go out with your little handheld radio, uh, get up there on uh, the highest band. Ideally, uh, if you'll come back to me, uh, Victor, ideally you get a small handheld like uh, this one right here and uh, hold it up to the uh, weather channel. And uh, once you're beginning to get the weather channel coming in, uh, this one on 162.450, which is relatively weak, Move it around, and when you put it right next to an LED light bulb, if all of a sudden the weather channel gets noisy or the signal disappears completely, then more than likely that's the light bulb that you're going to need to replace. We're doing a survey to see which light bulbs are the quietest, but no one thing. It's not so much HF that gets affected by the light-emitting diode, but rather VHF at 130 to about 160 with a real peak between 140 and 164. That's where all of the noise coming off of the uh, more home style light emitting diodes is taking place. So something to think about on the VHF bands. Well, one way to get around that, of course, is to operate on HF. That's what we're going to be doing this weekend, Easter weekend. So look for us on the air. And one of our favorite tuners that we're going to be using because we're going to be in the field and we're going to put up all sorts of long wires and uh, dipole antennas is the LDG antenna tuners. And LDG does a fabulous job of getting your signal out of your HF radio uh, up the coax, making the coax uh, uh, as a part of the transmission line to get all of that energy into the antenna. Your radio is now going to put out more power because you reduce that SWR to Zippo. So let's take a look and see what's happening with LDG. Yeah, they are special pieces of kit, that's for sure. This episode of Ham Nation brought to you by LDG Electronics. LDG Electronics provides state-of-the-art automatic antenna tuners for every amateur need from QRP to QRO, fixed, portable, and remote. 
An LDG tuner will absolutely match your radio to your antenna using their lightning fast proprietary tuning algorithms. You got to check out the LDG AT1000 Pro 2. That is the flagship automatic antenna tuner. It's made for QRO or high power hams. It'll handle a thousand watts sideband, 500 watts FM, and digital tune from 1.8 to 54 megahertz continuously. That's uh, 160 to 6 meters. You can match Yagi's, dipoles, inverted Vs, slopers, virtually any coax fed antenna from 6 to 1,000 ohms in impedance. And tuning time, under 10 seconds. Memory tuning, under two-tenths of a second. Large, easy-to-read bar graph watt meter with two selectable ranges on that thing. Dual antenna switch, 2,000 memories for each position. These things are amazing. And LDG is a family-owned and operated company. And that's that's important. That means that they are absolutely dedicated to bringing innovative quality products to the amateur market. Their focus is on anticipating and meeting your needs and providing you with world-class support that is only a phone call or an email away. Every LDG tuner carries a full two-year warranty and it's fully transferable. So if you ever sell or give away your LDG tuner, uh, the remainder of the warranty goes with it. Free return shipping on all warranty repairs. All LDG products, including balance and cables, are available for purchase through select retailers. So check out which automatic antenna tuner is right for you. Go to LDG Electronics to learn more. That's LDGelectronics.com to learn more. LDGelectronics.com. And uh, we certainly thank them for their support of Ham Nation. Good stuff, LDG. Let's uh, check out the news of the week now from Amateur Radio Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2163, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 17th, 2019. The FCC is receiving comments on one ham's petition that wants to change the way hams use digital modes. The debate continues as the FCC reviews a rulemaking petition from a Nebraska amateur who wants the agency to require all protocols used in digital codes to be open source, publicly available, and unencrypted. The petition by Ron Kolarik, K0IDT, is known as RM11831 and has sparked a debate creating a digital divide in the ham community. The proposal has been endorsed by noted researcher Ted Rappaport, N9NB, the founder of the NYU Wireless Research Center at New York University, who believes the transparency being sought is part of the spirit of amateur radio and that the spectrum is, in his words, a gift that should be available for everyone to share. Dissenting opinions filed with the FCC argue that the enactment of such a proposal would seriously stifle the use of data modes on the radio bands. Opponents of the proposal include Lauren Cutchins, W3QA, president of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, which oversees WinLink, the worldwide radio messaging system used on the ham bands for emergency services that include email with attachments, position reporting, and weather bulletins. Time is running out. Those wishing to comment to the FCC have until the 29th of April to do so. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0, DGY. In the U.S., two government shortwave stations are giving support and a time slot to the Department of Defense. WWV and WWVH, the shortwave radio stations of the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, are making provisional time slots available to the U.S. Department of Defense for announcements of military communications exercises on the HF bands, activities that include amateur radio. The first announcements will be heard between the 20th of April and the 3rd of May in connection with an interoperability exercise in Wisconsin. The announcements will be heard at 10 minutes past the hour on WWV and at 50 minutes past the hour on WWVH. The U.S. Army Military Auxiliary Radio Systems Program Manager, Paul English, WD8DBY, said that the Defense Department's use of the broadcast time slots will be a big help in the Mars program's mission to reach out to the ham community. WWV UV and WWVH transmit on 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz. Another transmission will occur in June for an exercise in Ohio. The government-funded stations faced closure under the agency's 2019 budget proposal last year, but were saved. However, the agency is now facing a cut of one-third of its current $1 billion budget under the president's 2020 fiscal year request. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. Amateur Radio's role in effective hurricane preparedness is again taking center stage at the 2019 National Hurricane Conference in New Orleans. 
The meetup runs from April 22nd to April 25th and will feature such participants as Ken Graham, WX4KEG, Director of the National Hurricane Center, Bob Robichaud, VE1MBR of the Canadian Hurricane Center, and Fred Kleber, K9VV, Manager of the ARRL Virgin Islands Section, which was hard hit by Hurricanes Irma and Maria. The gathering will also feature a presentation by Bill Feist, WB8BZH of the National Salvation Army Team Emergency Radio Network, or Saturn, and a discussion by Julio Rapol, WD4R, who will give an overview of the operations of WX4NHC, the National Hurricane Center's ham radio station. Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, manager of the Hurricane Watch Net, will explain the net's role in various emergency situations. Rob Macedo, KD1CY, will discuss the work of the VoIP Hurricane Net. The conference provides an opportunity to improve hurricane preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation in the United States and the Caribbean and Pacific. For details, visit the website, hurricanemeeting.com. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. We're halfway through the nominating period for the Newsline WA6ITF Youngham of the Year Award. Full details in the nominating form can be found on our website, arnewsline.org, under the YHOTY tab. Nominations close May 31st at midnight Eastern. We'll present the award in August at the Huntsville Ham Fest in Alabama. And that's all from the Amateur Radio News Line, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, Jack Parker, W8ISH, Skeeter Nash, N5ASH, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW. 7 3. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. Massive Region 2738 begins to rotate off of the Earth-facing Sun over the next few days. And get ready, because Earth is about to enter the Lyrid Meteor Shower. Those stories and more in the news this week. Space weather this week settles down just a bit, even as Region 2738 continues to impress us. As we flip to our front side sun, you can see that massive region there. It's continuing to fire off small solar flares, but it's not a risk for major radio blackouts right now. However, it is boosting the solar flux up well into the marginal range for amateur radio and shortwave radio and emergency responders. So enjoy some decent radio propagation on Earth's day side. After that, we're not seeing very much in terms terms of solar storm prospects. In fact, if we flip to our backside sun, we do see a couple small coronal holes that will be rotating into Earth view here in the next few days, and it might bring us a little bit of fast solar wind and possibly a little bit of aurora in about two weeks. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are still getting hit by sporadic pockets of fast solar wind from these tiny coronal holes, but they're really not amounting to all that much. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled conditions with up to about a 20% chance of a minor storm but over the next couple days, and then things should begin to settle down. At mid-latitudes, we're only expecting normal to unsettled conditions with about a 15% chance of active conditions, but again, things should settle down pretty pretty rapidly. And after that, it looks like it's going to be probably about another two weeks before we get a chance for a decent solar storm. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, region 2738 is going to be disappearing behind the sun's west limb here in the next couple days. And unfortunately, it's going to take most of its solar flux right along with it. This may make GPS users very happy because you guys like the low solar flux, but you amateur radio and emergency responders, you're not going to like the fact that the solar flux is going to tank here in the next few days. And probably by the beginning of next week, we could be back back into poor conditions for radio propagation. Now we're gonna have to deal with this easily over the next week and possibly two weeks before we get a reprieve and get that solar flux boosted again. Now also because we are at solar minimum, we do have a higher cosmic ray impingement than we normally would have. So you frequent flyers, and this includes air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes, you are in the marginal range for radiation dose. And this does include you prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. 
So space weather this week is definitely calming down. We're still getting hit by small sporadic pockets of fast solar wind from these tiny remnant coronal holes that we're seeing on the sun, but it's really not amounting to much. So your aurora photographers, you're probably not going to get much of a chance to see aurora. It will be pretty elusive, but never fear, because this week we are going to be hit by the Lyrid meteor shower, so you can still point your camera skyward. Just be sure to stay away from that very bright full moon that's going to be passing us right around the 20th and the 21st. Now, meanwhile, back on the sun, we have region 2738 that's going to be rotating off the sun's west limb, and it's going to take that solar flux with it. Now, this makes GPS users quite happy because there, you should be able to enjoy some decent reception with the so low solar flux on the Earth's day side. But amateur radio and shortwave radio, along with emergency responders, well, it looks like we're going to be dropping into poor radio propagation conditions on Earth's day side easily for the next week, and I hate to say it, probably the next two weeks before we might get a reprieve and we can boost that solar flux back up for you. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Dr. T. Always good to have you on the program. And uh, if you don't subscribe to her on Twitter, you certainly need to, at Tamitha Scove on Twitter. She mentioned shortwave, and of course, we're being heard on WTWW at 5085 and uh, 15.810. Uh, the big blowtorch up there in uh, Tennessee, if you've got some ham radio related stuff you'd like them to know and you'd like them to tell everybody else, uh, you can email it to them. The email address is simple. It's email at WTWW.us and they love signal reports too. So thanks to Ted and everybody up at WTWW. Speaking of huge shortwave stations, the Voice of America Museum uh, right near Dayton, Ohio, is having some uh, big doings for Hamvention. And here's a little info on that. The National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting, a short drive from Hamvention, announces expanded hours for Hamvention weekend. The museum is located at the site of the former Voice of America Bethany Relay Station in Westchester, between Dayton and Cincinnati, just off the I-75 Tylersville Road exit. From 1944 through 1994, Six of the most powerful shortwave transmitters in the world broadcast to listeners seeking truth in Europe, Africa, and South America from the Bethany Station. Every week, millions heard programs in 50 different languages beamed globally from this hilltop. Those attending the 2019 Dayton Hamvention will have ample opportunity to visit. The museum is located about 35 minutes from the main convention activities. The Ham Shack for WC8VOA will be open, as well as some unique exhibits, such as the comprehensive collection of Drake Amateur Radio Gear, the remaining Collins 250,000-watt transmitter, the 1960s VOA Master Control Room, the Powell Crosley Jr. exhibit, and an exhibit aboard the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Courier, a Cold War-era floating radio transmission facility that relayed VOA Bethany broadcasts to the Middle East and Soviet Union. The VOA Museum is open every Saturday and Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. Special hours for Hamvention attendees are Thursday, May 16th from 4 to 9 p.m. Friday, May 17th from 4 to 9 p.m. Saturday, May 18th from 1 to 9 p.m. And Sunday, May 19th from 1 to 5 p.m. Admission is just a $5 donation. In addition this year, the museum has a special offer for new donors visiting during Hamvention on Saturday, May 18th only. From 6.30 to 9 p.m., new museum donors of at least $45 will receive free general admission to the museum, a guided tour of the museum's Crosley collection, a tour of the historic WLW transmitter site featuring the Crosley 500-kilowatt WLW transmitter. This tour will be conducted by internationally known broadcast veterans J. Adrick, K8CJY, and Jeff Mendenhall, W8GNM. Transportation from the museum to the WLW transmitter site and back is included. Space is limited on the WLW transmitter tour and reservations are required. To sign up, visit voamuseum.org. See you at the museum. More information about the museum and the special WLW transmitter tour option is available at voamuseum.org. Man, if you're going to go to Dayton, you're going to go to Hamvention, you definitely need to check that out. That is, uh, we went a couple of years ago, and it's, it's a great museum. Uh, WLW was off the table at that time. We couldn't take the tour, but uh, if you can possibly do that, 
definitely carve out some time to do that because it's just an amazing place. We've got Valerie coming up in a little bit with uh, Dayton After Dark. We've got Georgia Smoke and Solder next right after this word from ICOM. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, is coming soon. This new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth setup. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com hams. Pack your bags because Dayton Hamvention is coming up from May 17th through 19th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. See the latest and greatest ICOM gear and meet hams from all over the world. And if you're going to Hamvention this year, I want you to go to icomamerica.com slash amateur and register for some limited edition swag prize kits that they'll be giving away to... Uh, some lucky attendee who has pre-registered there at the site. Uh, I saw last year's some really great swag prizes in there. And why not? If you're going to Hamvention, go to icomamerica.com slash amateur now and register because you could win. That's icomamerica.com slash amateur. And our monthly drawings are our weekly drawings. ICOM's inviting you to go weekly after each episode of Ham Nation to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and register to win great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats at icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Uh, for April, you'll, of course, you'll automatically be entered in the grand prize drawing for new radio. For April, that's the ID5100A Deluxe Innovative 2-meter, 70-centimeter mobile with touchscreen built-in D-Star and analog, built-in GPS, DVD dual watch, optional Bluetooth board available, and there's a Bluetooth and Android app available for download. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode of hamnation and register to win. Sign up, good luck in the contest. And as promised, well, actually promised this last week, I've been reading a good book here. It's the uh, the ARRL Repeater Directory, the 2019 edition. If you haven't looked in one of those in a few years, there, there could be some things that have changed in there. So let's take a look and see what's in the current edition. The 2019 edition of the ARRL Repeater Directory is available now. And I haven't looked in a repeater directory in the last few years so it's about time. Let's take a look and see what's in this version here. Oh, by the way, something that's changed since the last one I looked in. Back in February of 2016, ARRL and RFinder announced a partnership agreement where the ARRL repeater directory will now use information from the online subscription RFinder repeater directory. Let's see what's in the new edition here. Well, first thing we got is our CTCSS and DCS frequencies, these are the tones you program into your rig so that you can access certain repeaters. In the old days, repeaters didn't use tones that much. These days, it's quite common to have a tone in a repeater. I wasn't aware that Motorola had their own alphanumeric designators for different tones, but there they are right there. 
Looking inside, the first thing after that is the band plans, starting with 10 meters on VHF, and it's got the UHF band plans as well. That tells you stuff in there like, oh, what modes you can operate on different portions of the band. Here's a two-meter band plan. It's got things like EME, moon bounce, CW, the SSB calling frequency, propagation beacons, the FM repeaters, simplex frequencies, all the things that you'd need to know and should be acquainted with before you get on the air operating. Now, this doesn't cover HF frequencies. Uh, frankly, there aren't repeaters on HF. VHF and UHF is where we're looking for them. It covers all the bands there. It goes on up to 10 gigahertz. So if you need to know the narrow band calling frequency on 10 gigahertz, you got it right there. There's also information in here on how to add new repeaters to the directory listing. Uh, there's a section on frequency coordinators. You know, these are the folks who voluntarily get together and help plan out different repeater frequency coordinations throughout the U.S. and Canada. We can see right here in my state, Mississippi, we use the Southeast Repeater Association. And some states, they could use more than one repeater coordinator. In that case, the directory listing is actually going to show which coordinator is coordinating that particular repeater. If you're new to amateur radio, just got your technician license, and you hear some things on the repeater you don't understand, well, this is a good guide right here to tell you what it might be. If you heard someone talking about descents, you could look up what that is. Or if they were talking about a reverse split. Or a machine. What does that mean? Well, it means a repeater system. This is stuff to help clarify some of the mysterious language that you might hear on a repeater. Then we get into the actual states here. Uh, Alabama, and it goes on through alphabetically, Arkansas, California. Here's some of the listings for Florida. Miami Beach, we can see we've got an FM repeater, wa 4 LWN on 444.625. It's got a positive offset, and there's no tone listed there. So we can access that one without programming the tone into our radio. Down here, though, there's a couple of more. You can see there's the tone frequencies that you'd need in your rig so that the repeater would accept your transmission and rebroadcast it. Over here, we can see the modes that we're running on the different repeaters. Here's a fusion one. Most repeaters are FM. Here's a couple of D-stars. Down here, there's a DMR repeater. And we can see it's on the Brandmeister network. And that's the way the listings go throughout the directory here. Now, fortunately, they've got it in a spiral-bound book here. So it's real easy to flip through the pages without tearing them. And you can turn to a page, and it will stay there. This would be great to have on a trip where you can just scroll through and See what might be available in the town you're passing through. Now, we've got all of the 50 states in here, and we've also got Canada, starting here at Alberta. A lot of uh, Canadian repeaters. If you want the most up-to-date information on repeaters in the U.S. and Canada, then the ARRL Repeater Directory 2019 edition is uh, something you want to look at. You can also get the app edition of the Repeater Directory, by going to subscribe.rfinder.net. Uh, it's $12.99 for an annual subscription. The ARRL Repeater Directory 2019 edition could be a great addition to your toolbox, especially if you're a new amateur. And, you know, that's one of those books that uh, I don't get every year, maybe every few years. Uh, because some repeaters will change. And now that they've got the app version available as well, that's a, a great resource there. I had not looked in one in a few years, so I was a, a little surprised to some of the things I saw in there, particularly that they're listing the different modes uh, for the different repeaters. That's that's good information to know. And I could, uh, I could tell here that uh, in Picayune, Mississippi, where Don Wilbanks lives, he has a UHF repeater, 443.725 KE5LT. So if I'm passing through the area and I want to talk to Don, 
uh, could do it right there if he had his radio on. I don't know. I don't know if Don has his radio on or not, though. Yeah, we've had some See, issues with the repeaters around here lately. They're they're, they're not all up anymore, so uh, I'm not sure which. There are actually like three repeaters in this area, and I think two of them are down. So the ones that are actually in Picayune are listed to Picayune are down, I think. The one in Poplarville, which is 25 miles away, I think that one's up. So Okay. You know, that that's the way repeaters go. You never yep. can tell for sure. According to this, though, uh, there's only one listed to pick you, and, uh, you know, if you're traveling, you might want to have one of these in the glove box. It's a handy tool for you. Randy wants to know what you've been building. Uh, send him your photos and descriptions, no videos, please, to hamprojects at twit.tv, and you could be in a future episode of Show us your projects. He's collecting stuff right now. So send him your photos and descriptions. Let him know what you've been building, wrenching, or soldering. Ham projects at twit.tv. And, you know, I'm looking forward to Dayton Hamvention here in a few weeks. I need to start on my shopping list because I haven't done that yet. But uh, making, making some plans. And, you know, it's not just all about Hamvention during the daytime. There's also a nightlife that goes on in Dayton, and Val's got the details for us. Okay, everybody, it's time to put on your smoking jackets, grab those pipes, and let's get ready for Dayton After Dark. That's right, you go to Dayton, you go to Hamvention every year, but what do you do when the gates close at the end of the day? I'm going to go over all the fun stuff you can do after Hamvention closes. So let's start first with dinners. AMSAT, uh, the T-A-P-R AMSAT Banquet is Friday night at the Kohler Presidential Center and uh, cost is only $40 and there's the website if you want to go to to get more information. They also have an informal dinner at Tickets and that's Thursday night. So go to their website, learn more. Are you into contesting or thinking about getting into contesting? Well, Saturday night is the contest dinner, and that's held at the Crown Plaza in Dayton on the second floor. If you want more information, go to contestdinner.com. You can also register there as well. Uh, hurry up, seats are running out. Uh, every night on the second floor of the Crown Plaza from about 7 to 8 or 8 p.m. till whenever uh, is the contest super suite uh, hangout and then around 10 30 11 o'clock every night free pizza and on thursday nights free pizza and wings more information go to contest super suite.com and if you love your flex radio well you'll be in good company if you go to a flex radio dinner they have one thursday night and friday night as well you can go to one or go to both more information, just go to flexradio.com, cost $50, and it's at the Hilton Garden Inn in Dayton at the South Austin Landing. If you like to DX, there's a DX dinner. Swodexa's hosting the DX dinner Friday night, and that's at the Dayton Marriott. Cocktails at 5.30, dinner at 6.45, or doors open, I should say. Go to swodexaevents.org if you want to purchase tickets or learn more. Lots of prizes at that one, too, by the way. Top band dinner, that's going on Friday night at the Crown Plaza. Cost is $38, and if you want to learn more about that, who's going to be speaking, what they're going to be talking about, stuff like that, or if you want to register, go to topbanddinner.com. Are you an avid Collins collector? Well, Collins is having a dinner Friday night. They're going to have the social starting at 6 p.m. and with dinner at 7. And that is at the Miami Valley Golf Club. For more information, go to con collinsradio.org slash events. But that's not all. There's something for everybody here, I tell you guys. The collegiate dinner. Now that is tentatively set for Friday night. Magda's working on a venue right now, so I will get more information to you uh, when I have it. But uh if you're college age and you want to hang out with like-minded ham radio people, that's your that's your go-to for uh, Friday night. Also, 
there's a digital contest dinner. Now, this one's informal. It's not like a formalized banquet with keynote speakers. And that's going to be Thursday night at the Spaghetti Warehouse. And uh, it's very reasonable for what you're getting. You're getting lasagna and spaghetti and meatballs, a whole menu. Uh, if you're interested in going, contact Ed Mons, W0YK. His email is on QRZ. I just didn't want to put it on the air. If you're into D-Star, well, there's a dinner for you. And that's Friday night at the Drury Inn on Miller Lane. Uh, more information will be uploaded real soon, if not already by now, at dstarinfo.com. Well, that does it for the dinners after dark at Dayton, but not the fun. Uh, if you're into QRP or home brewing, uh, there's a place for you. There's the five days in May. They have it every five days during Hamvention. So if you want to learn more, you can go to the qrparci.org. Uh, and learn more about Five Days in May. Um, and one of the events sounds really fun, and that's Friday night. It's a homebrew contest. So you can bring your homebrew project in if you want to register and try and win. Um, they have five different categories listed there. Register your uh, homebrew project from 7 to 8, and then people can come in and view them from 8 to 10. So that sounds like a lot of fun. That sounds like something I would find George at for sure. Okay, ready for your 10 minutes of fame? Well, show up for a live podcast. Wednesday night, we're going to be doing Ham Nation live from the Crown Plaza on the second floor in the Super Suite. So come on out, show your support, be on the air. Uh, also, Thursday night, Ham Talk Live is going to be doing their show live at the Spring Hill Suites. Something else you can do one of the nights at Dayton, both Friday and Saturday night, Dara has their open house. They open up their Ham Shack, Whiskey 8 Bravo India, Really nice club station, and uh, you can take the grand tour. No registration needed. Just show up. There's the address right there, and uh, see what they've got going on. Also, we've got the Kansas City DX Club. They have their uh, annual CW pileup competition, and that is Saturday night in Hospitality Suite 525, the fifth floor of the Crown. Uh, free to participate free to view it's a lot of fun watching the scores post as everybody tries to compete so make sure you don't miss that one and that does it for this year's segment Dayton after dark seems like we are in state CUSO party full swing uh, there's been so many state CUSO parties going on these last few months or this weekend which is Easter weekend happy Easter everybody uh, you will have the Michigan and the Ontario State CUSO Party. So uh, if you want to get on the air, avoid your family, which some of you may want to do, there's your opportunity. Oh, honey, you got to work the Michigan State CUSO Party. Uh, also, for the following weekend, Florida State CUSO Party. Now, that's a nice big one. That was fun because you will not be calling CQ over and over and over again. Uh, you will get a lot of takers. Big CUSO party, a lot of fun. I even sponsor a plaque for that one. Uh, so get on the air this weekend, next weekend, and uh, add some more counties to your log. There you go. Thanks, Val. Good stuff. And remember, if you're going to any of those Dayton After Dark Hamvention uh, festivities, make sure you look your best with the Gordon West Collection. The Gordon West Collection, strictly QRO. Can we put that slide up again so everyone can look their best in the Gordon West collection? Ah, yes. Wow. And remember, available exclusively at Mervyn's Gottschalk's Casual Corner, today's men and select West Marine locations. And while you're wearing your Gordon West collection, make sure that uh, you check out peakptt.com because this episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Peak PTT, the leading provider of Push to talk systems for business communications. Company cell phones are not only expensive, they can also be a huge time waster for employees. Boost productivity, cut down costs today with Peak PTT. Everyone knows, at least if you're a ham, you know that PTT stands for push to talk. And Peak provides advanced IP-based push to talk systems for small, medium, and enterprise businesses. Leverage the internet, cellular data, and Wi-Fi networks to transmit voice over the internet. Uh, Peak, Peak PTT gives you instant talk, location monitoring, and emergency alert notifications, local nationwide and worldwide coverage, rugged devices that are made to withstand dirt, water, and extreme temperatures, and no contracts, and billing is month to month. Less than one second connection time. Pretty slick. Connect with hundreds of users at once or talk privately with anybody in your group. 
Central Tracking and Communication Center from NEPC, real-time GPS tracking for accurate and complete visibility. The K2 PTT system is ideal for small and medium-sized businesses. That system includes an affordable walkie-talkie style handheld handset, iOS and Android apps, and PC dispatch software for device location tracking. The Everest PTT system is capable of handling deployments of any size. This includes uh, a very rugged handset, the PTT 584G, five nines of network availability, lower latency rates, and uh, some of the most significant players in the industry. PC dispatch uh, console to locate devices on demand and view on a map. Push to talk calls last an average of about 15 seconds versus 50 seconds for traditional calls. Get in touch faster. Operate more efficiently with Peak PTT. Visit peakptt.com. Use promo code TWIT at checkout and you'll get 15% off. That's peakptt.com. Promo code TWIT for 15% off. And we thank Peak PTT for their support of Ham Nation. Amanda's got the chat room stuff. What's going on in the chat room tonight? Well, we have so much going on. First of all, thank you, Val. And who did not like the way Val narrated that? Dating Sweet. After Hours. She did an awesome swanky. job. Quite yes, swanky. Very. All right. Let me see. I'm sorry. I'm delaying while I'm trying to get to my questions here. So first thing, another thing about Dayton is there's other things going on on some of the off hours or off days, I should say. And Gordo would know about one of these. Eris is having kind of their own satellite university so you can go and learn how to join up learn a lot about working and this is uh from the ground level up but uh, isn't that correct gordo um that is and we encourage everyone if you've got time and you get into dayton a little bit early a r i s s dot o r g and you'll read more about it and you might even earn one of these aries pins for being one of the volunteers helping promote more up-to-date equipment for the international space station which it's soon to be on its way up into space back to you amanda Okay, and some of the other off things that they have there during Dayton, they're actually having the Oxcom class training, and it's a it's a very intense twenty hour intensive training to learn how to integrate. Not actually being an Aries member, but learning how to integrate and working with your public safety people and how to use their frequencies and how to operate on their radios and how to put it put together an actual IAP using their plans and you take and you you put some of yours in there and some of theirs in the frequencies and you learn how to interoperate. So again, another kind of thing that's not exactly popular, but it's a very important thing to do if you're if you're wanting to go that next step in your Aries, uh, the amateur radio emergency service stuff. So, all right. And another thing it Dayton this year. Let's not forget, we're going to have uh, Dr. Tamitha Scove there. So everyone's going to be lining up to say hi to her and greet her and tell her how amazing she is. So that's another feature we've got at Dayton this year that no one's going to want to miss. So I kind of wanted to bring up some discussion stuff, not really a lot of questions, you guys, but these are some interesting subjects that have been br brought up lately. And the first one, it was on um, AR Newsline. What about the transparency of digital modes? What does everyone think? Gordo, I'll, I'll let you start. Do you believe in making it more transparent or do you believe Pactor should be the way it is right now? No, I'm really looking forward that WinLink is going to be able to get uh, the bandwidth and the uh, go ahead for uh, some of the uh, slight speed up in their speed. And I think we need to stay open minded that digital is here. And uh, while we don't want to uh, force any uh, one out of the CW bands, um, everybody's looking just for their own little spot. And of course, all the focus is on WinLink and WinLink link is our key to get the public safety officials saying, wow, ham radio is up, yet our computers are down and they're tied into a, uh, an internet connection uh, 500 miles away. I think we ought to let more hams uh, join our emergency group. So um, I'm hoping that uh, everybody will stay open-minded, read the proposals, 
read those that have questions or doubts about the proposal and then come up with what you think is going to be your best uh, bet on uh, getting more digital modes where all hams can take advantage of all that uh, ham radio bands can offer. Amanda? Okay. Uh, George, do you have any comment on it? Well, um, I, I would say that the current digital modes we've got, I think they comply with the spirit of the, the no codes and ciphers um, language that's in the FCC rules. Those radios are, when you transmit in one of those digital modes, you're not transmitting really a, a hidden signal. Uh, the the codecs and things you need to decode them with are readily available. Now, they're not all free and open source, uh, mainly because the Ambi chip that all of them use, or the majority of them use, is, um, is a commercial product. But uh, there again, it's not like you, you don't have access to it. The chips are readily available. Uh, the radios are so, you know... You can't really go to digital and you're hiding uh, or obscuring your transmission. So that, that's kind of my opinion on it. That's a great opinion. Uh, and Don, what do you think? Yeah, I, I want to echo what Gordon said. Digital is here, whether you like it or not, whether you want to adopt it or not. Um, you can or you can't. It doesn't matter. It's But uh, anything that, that helps out public safety and emergency communications, which is a huge part of WinLink, uh, anything that that helps uh, further the cause for that, uh, I'm I'm all about. So, uh, like I said, you know, it's a brave new world. Digital's here. Uh, we're not just a bunch of old men sitting down in a basement tapping out Morse code anymore. Uh, you know, here. it's uh, amateur radio is modern and it's vital and it saves lives. And anything that helps that is good. You're absolutely correct. So my view on it is that I see a lot of states now taking on encrypted DTR radios. And we're so we're telling these people, our um, public safety, our law enforcement officers, that we don't want to see you go encrypted. We don't want it. Um, I think it's a, a public safety issue. I, and I personally am kind of on board with that. Encrypt what you need to when you're going to make a drug buster, SWAT team move. So I'm kind of on board with saying, yeah, maybe we should make it accessible. What, what do we actually have to hide? But, you know, everyone's going to have an opinion about it. So um, I just don't want to see us fighting at our at our public safety and saying, but we should make them have to decipher this and buy extra equipment. I don't know. I'm still, I'm on, I'm here on it. Uh, the next kind of controversial thing is our new technician license that everyone would like to see. Well, I shouldn't say everyone would like to see go through, but... Uh, limited privileges and uh, getting you on board and hoping that those new technicians will upgrade from there. I My personal feeling is, yeah, maybe we should do that license with a very, very short period of time, maybe expiring in a year or two. Uh, Gordo, I, I'm sure this is big on your plate. What do you think about the new technician license uh, proposal? Well, I think it would be good to get technician class operators that maybe joined ham radio with a small handheld thinking more about there's more about ham radio than just an HT on FM or on some of the digital modes. So give them the digital modes down on 75 meters, 40 meters, 15 meters, and they have now digital modes on 10 meters. As for the voice modes on uh, 80 meters and 40 meters and 15 meters, um, that's a lot of room for the techs. I'd like to see it maybe uh, pared down a little bit so the generals advance and extras we don't feel squeezed out. But we think voice modes are pretty exciting because on voice modes, you never know who might be calling you from space. William Bravo 6, Nancy Ocean America. <laughs> William Bravo 6, Nancy Ocean America. This is W5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima returning your call along with several other stations. 
I mean, when you might hook up with uh, a rare station that uh, a tech uh, would not normally be able to do on uh, the VHF, UHF bands, although we have plenty of ways of getting overseas with all the uh, capabilities of V and U and all the Internet. But uh, bouncing signals off the ionosphere, not what we did just now, but uh, before, that's exciting to techs. And I would hope that might get more techs upgrading to general class, but even more important than upgrading, get them on the air and off of just the single two-meter channel that's been pre-programmed in their HT. Amanda? I like that view. I really do. Uh, George, what do you think? Uh, I'm I'm for giving them some expanded privileges, giving them some HF privileges. You know, this is not a brand new idea. They've been doing it in other countries or, or a number of other countries for several years now and those countries are still there and they still have amateur radio um i, I don't think it's going to hurt anything i actually think it will help because like gordo was saying guys get licensed as technicians they maybe get a handheld radio and then they disappear after a few months give them a little extra to do you know some some more privileges where they can flex their muscles a little bit, get on the air, uh, enjoy the hobby. I personally know too many people uh, who have gotten licensed. I'd hear them IDing on the repeaters around town, uh, maybe hear them two or three months, and then they're never heard from again. You know, we, we need to change that. Right. Well, there you, you, where you, there you go. And um, Don, what do you think about it? Yeah, I, I think I'm all for that. Uh, I think that the best way, probably the best place to put uh, a technician on HF would be give them a little slice of 40 and uh, some of the warp bands because 40A is is easy to easy to operate. It's one of the best bands around. And the warp bands, there's a whole lot less pressure uh, than there is, say, on 20 and 75. You can get lost and really, you can get lost on 20 and 75. Uh, meters <laughs> real fast, especially if you're a newcomer to HF, you can get lost and, and you can get plowed under real fast. I think uh, there's some, the, the 17 meters would be a great spot to put uh, some technician privileges on because it's uh, nice, easy going and very gentlemanly. And I think that would be a good spot. Right. That's great. And, you know, the funny thing is that I was a technician a long time while Jeff was a general. And the only reason I got a taste of that was because I listened to him working people on the HF bands in the general portion saying, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, so maybe I'm open to it, maybe giving them a slice of it to let them see how cool it could be and uh, encourage, thing, encourage thing, them to, to go further. Um, and I just want to, yes, chat room. I'm not saying that anything in the ham radio portion is ever encrypted in digital. That's not where I was going with that. I'm just saying that some of us have been fighting for making sure that our public safety bands are not encrypted all the time. And it's kind of the same thing when they want to be able to have open source to some of our digital modes so they know exactly what traffic is being passed. Never said it was encrypted. I promise you. Um, but I think I we, we need to get do more to get people into amateur radio. And maybe if this is what it takes, how, who am I to say otherwise? I got licensed when there was no CW code required. So I can't say much. I can't. So let's do it and let's get some people on the air and maybe we can enjoy the hobby just a little bit more. That's, that's my opinion. Don? Plenty of room in the pool for everybody. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Except for on contest weekends, just you know, unless you go on the work. Well, see, that's okay. The, the, what because uh, because there aren't any contests for the most part on the work bands. That's a perfect yeah. place to put a brand new technician with those to, with those privileges. There you go. All right, let me go over some nets real fast. Like Kieran will wrap this show up almost on time. I think um, we have D Star on fourteen Charlie. We have DMR on TAC three eleven and uh, forty meters. I did not. See a listing for that, Kevin. Update me on chat real quick. Like, 
Steve's going to be doing 20 meters on 14 to 68. So let's hope the bands are open there and everyone can join in and get on some of those nets, HF or digital and have some fun out there. I think I saw that there are no DMR nets tonight because they don't have any net controllers. So DMR is probably out tonight. Okay. And 7192, Kevin says 7192 is for the 40 meter net. There you go. Oh, and happy Easter, everybody. Yes. Happy Easter. And uh, I'm just uh, thoughts out to uh, the folks over in Paris with the loss of uh, Notre Dame. Just, oh, my God. I was horrified watching that. Um, the history. I think we and all were. Not just, the, not just the history, but uh, what it means on a, on a, just a spiritual basis for, uh, for, for those. And thank God that a lot of the art and, and things were saved, but uh, losing that building was just, mm. they say they're going to rebuild it. Let's, uh, well, be watching that for a long time. Amanda, thank you so much. Yeah, you do a great job. Uh, Gordon, any final words before we close it up tonight? No, I concur with you. Our thoughts are with Paris and the huge loss, but uh, ultimately it'll be a gain because of the billions that have been promised to uh, uh, rebuild that structure and all that it stands for. Happy Easter, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Hope to hear you on HF, probably 20 meters uh, this weekend, especially Saturday. Uh, We'll be on the air Portable, uh, testing loops, testing a giant 20-meter antenna that chip K7JA homebrewed and is going to get it up about 40 feet. So we'll see you on the air this Saturday and maybe even Easter Sunday. Happy Easter, all. Chip's the man. God, Chip is the man for sure. George, uh, any final words tonight before we close? Well, uh, the only words I got is uh, happy Easter to everyone. And next week, Ray Novak is going to be visiting here. He's going to have the uh, new IC9700 with him. Tommy and I are going to try to wrestle it away from him. We've been unsuccessful so far. You know, Ray's (laughs) Ray's a pretty strong fellow. But uh, he will have that here. I think we're going to be shooting that Monday night and some more radios on Tuesday. And he'll be with us on Ham Nation uh, next Wednesday night. So, uh, looking forward to visiting with Ray again and learning some more about these new radios. Yeah, good stuff. I'm uh, looking forward to that. So, all right, guys, uh, I think Bob will be back next week and uh, can't wait to see Valerie live on camera. Uh, thanks to Dr. T as well for everything that she does uh, for us. And thanks to you uh, for watching and thanks to Twit for letting us come on here and do what we do. So happy Easter to all. And uh, God bless, and we'll see you next week. So good night and 7-3, everybody. I forgot one announcement. This one's a big one to me because I listen to my public safety all the time. But this is actually Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. So thank you to all of our 911 operators, dispatchers out there. You guys rock it. You never get enough. Uh, praise for what you do and I listen to you all day long and you're too busy for words so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well said. Well said. Good night, everybody. Good night. 7-3.